The Lord be with you. My name is Pastor Jennifer, and it's my joy to welcome each and every one of you here to worship this morning. I'm so grateful that you are here. University Baptist Church is an inquisitive and inclusive community of faith. If you would like to connect with us more deeply or get to know us better, you can fill out the, the card in your pew back and drop it off in one of our offering boxes, either in the front or in the welcome area. We also don't take offering by passing the plate, and so if you would like to give, you may do so either way there. As we get underway, I want to draw our attention to some announcements. First of all, we um, are having prime timers coming this Tuesday. We're going to hear a lecture on bees um, and visit with each other over a wonderful lunch by Season with Love. And so call the office, but make sure you've got it on your calendar. Show up at 1130 this Tuesday. This Friday, we are having a young-ish, younger, young sort of uh, adult fellowship. So if you think you fall in that category, we are going to watch the Barbie movie together at 645. Wear pink. Um, and I'm encouraging you all to buy tickets in advance. Let me know if you're coming. Um, but I do expect the theater to be packed out on opening weekend. And so then if you still have it in you at like 8.30, uh, we'll grab some beverages, or you can go home at that point, either way. Um, but join us for the Barbie movie this Friday. Then this coming Sunday is our fourth Sunday fellowship. So we'll have some Shipley's Donuts, a.k.a. the best, and uh, we'll have coffee together at 9 o'clock. So come mingle for that. And then we are updating our church family directory. So if you didn't like your photo last time, or if you've moved, um, please let us know. Send us a new one, and we're happy to update that. This morning at 5 a.m., our Passport Kids packed up from this parking lot and headed off to camp in uh, Georgia. And so if you would, throughout this week, be in prayer for them. Um, Bethany uh, Rigney and Larry Sparkman are our chaperones. And I'm so grateful for them for volunteering. And so just keep our kiddos in prayer as they experience community and Christ's love at Passport. Finally, I want to offer a huge thank you to all of our folks who volunteered with Compassion Camp this past week. We had about 35 kiddos. It felt like 30 of those were four-year-olds. Um, and so we had a wonderful time, but I had a friend in town, and he remarked that so many churches are no longer doing these programs because they're intense. They require a lot from volunteers, and so I'm proud of UBC for the past week. Getting to hear kiddos' voices in our building was a wonderful gift, and so thank you all as a church um, for allowing and enabling that to happen in the past week. With all of that said, let's Take a moment, take a breath, acknowledge the Spirit of God among us this morning as we worship together.
drop is falling now can just rule our spirit. The water begins to ripple.
At this time, we'll have our story for all ages. All right, all of our kiddos are basically at Passport Children's Camp or exhausted from Compassion Camp. I know I was. And so <laughs> this morning, we have some shy folks in the back, so I'm still going to tell our story. So we are talking about what it means to obey God. And so as we continue to talk about Jonah, Jonah is somebody who failed to obey God. And so when he failed, he ended up in the belly of a fish. And now I know I told you all last week that this was not a story about a fish, but all we're talking about today is a fish. And so I brought with me, and if some of our kiddos after the service want to come smell what that maybe smelled like, I have a container here, and you can come and see if you can identify what type of fish it might have smelled like to be in the belly of the whale. And so I'm going to read from our Peace Table Bible just to the section that we're talking about today for us. So God called to Jonah and said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and tell the people that they are doing things that are wrong. Instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah boarded a boat sailing the opposite direction towards Tarshish. A huge sto storm arose, wind blew and howled, waves crashed against the ship, and water poured across the deck. At any moment, the ship would break apart. The sailors were terrified. They threw cargo overboard to try to lighten the load of the ship. They prayed to their gods, begging for safety. Down below deck, Jonah had fallen asleep. The captain shook him awake. What are you doing? Get up. Call on your God to save us. The sailors got together. Who was to blame? They cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. Jonah said, I am a Hebrew, but I am fleeing from God who made the sea and the land. Throw me into the sea, and the storm will stop. The sailors did not want to do this. They tried rowing to shore, but the storm just got worse. Finally, they picked Jonah up, and they threw him into the sea. The wind stopped. The water became God sent a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah spent three days and nights inside the fish. He prayed, I called out to you, Lord, and you answered me. You heard my voice. You flung me into the sea. The waters flowed over me. Seaweed wrapped around my head. Down, down, down I went. But you brought me up from the pit. Just when I thought I would drown, my prayer came to you. And now with great thanks, I will keep my promise. You are the only one who has power to save. God spoke to the fish, and it spit Jonah onto dry land. Let's say the prayer that Jesus taught us together now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We will continue this morning in our reading of Jonah, chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. I am going to be reading from the Robert Alter translation of this text, but you may follow along in your pew Bible on page 848 and 849. The roots, to the roots of the mountains I went down, the underworld's bolts against me forever. But you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my, breath, as my life breath grew faint within me, the Lord did I recall. And my prayer came unto you, to your holy temple. Those who look to vaporous lies will turn away from their mercy. And with a voice of thanksgiving, let me sacrifice to you. What I vowed, let me pray. Rescue is the Lord's. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. I particularly like the Hebrew numbering of this text because instead of putting that first verse in chapter 1, it moves it to chapter 2. And it says, And the Lord set out a great fish to swallow Jonah. That one line there is about God's both provision and power over all creation. In the story of Jonah, we see God intervene by using the wind and the waves of the sea. And then we see God command a creature in order to save Jonah, to deliver him from himself. Later on in this text, we see God use a plant and a worm 
And so here we are continuing in this theme that God has power over all. As I was studying this text, one of the interesting features that I noted last Sunday is that the fish is only mentioned three times. And yet, it's the part of the story that we focus on the most. It's the most dramatic. It's the easiest to put into a mural or a drawing. But as I studied this fish, something interesting happens between verses 1 and verses 2. In the Hebrew, the fish is male in verse 1 and female in verse 2. And so I was trying to figure out, was this just a a mistranslation? Did somebody edit it wrong? And I turned to the Midrash, which is the ancient rabbinic writings on the text. And they talk about the male fish having too much room in it, that Jonah was too comfortable in the male fish. And so God sent another fish, a pregnant fish, to swallow Jonah instead, where he was more enclosed, there was literally less space that forced him to say this prayer. Other rabbis disagree. They say it wasn't out of malice or because Jonah wouldn't pray. It was because God was trying to show that there was new life possible. All of a sudden, Jonah is encapsulated in this womb, womb that could be deadly but could also be new life. And so Jonah is is in this fish, and for three days and three nights, it tells us. Obviously, as folks who follow Christ, we see the clear parallel between Christ's death and resurrection, between his own entombment, or you could call it an enwombment, because what emerged from the resurrection was indeed new life. And so Jonah is swallowed by this fish, by this leviathan, by this certain type of shark, perhaps. But the point is, God provides it. And in the midst of it, Jonah goes on to offer poetry for the first time. We, at the past week of Compassion Camp, talked about how poetry is is a powerful way to convey feeling and thought. It's meant to draw your attention to something. And so the the text shifts gears into poetry, into, of all things, a thanksgiving psalm. I called out from my straits to the Lord. He answered me. From the belly of Sheol, I cried out and you heard my voice. You flung me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. And the current came around me, all your breakers and waves streamed over me. And I thought, I am banished before your eyes. Yet again, I will look at your holy temple. Water lapped about me to the neck, and the deep came around me. Weed was bound round my head. To the roots of the mountain I went down. The underworld's bolts against me forever. And then you get that but. But you brought up my life from the pit. That's where my attention stayed most of this week. I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean to hit rock bottom, to find your life suddenly consumed in the pit. Sometimes it's because of decisions that we did make, like Jonah, And other times, it's decisions that were forced upon us or we had no control over. And more often than that, it's it's some sort of mix of the two. And as I was thinking about Jonah being in the pit, I kept returning to someone named Cheryl Strayed. Cheryl is a writer, and in her early 20s, her marriage imploded. Her mother died of breast cancer at 45. She was dabbling in and out of heroin use. Her whole life hit rock bottom. And she decided something had to give, something had to change. And so she decided, having never been a hiker before, to hike the Pacific Crest Trail over a thousand miles in the wilderness. And there, she confronted her deep grief and her loss 
and her heart, and she rebuilt her life. And if you're thinking, this sounds like a movie, it's because it is. <laughs> it's called Wild. Reese Witherspoon picked up the rights for it. Oprah made her autobiography a, a book club pick. But the thing that, that Cheryl so beautifully demonstrates is, is sometimes it's only at rock bottom that you can truly and completely change. I don't know about you, but I don't like change. I like routine. I like ordering the same thing. I like going to the same places. And yet, our most profound growth sometimes comes when we are forced to change. And so my first question for us this morning is when have you found yourself at rock bottom? When have you found yourself in a deep pit? And what changed for you as you attempted to come out of that space? Jonah here goes on in his psalm and of thanksgiving, and he continues to praise God, saying, God, you brought me up out of the pit. As my life breath grew faint within me, the Lord I did recall. There's something about being at rock bottom that makes us remember God. It's that old phrase, there's no such thing as atheists and foxholes, right? There's something about the bottom that makes us remember. And my prayer came unto you, to your holy temple, those who look to vaporous lies will turn away from their mercy. And I, with a voice of thanksgiving, let me sacrifice to you, Jonah says. What I vowed, let me pay. Rescue is the Lord's. I think that's the other profound thing that Jonah does here. Jonah offers a prayer of thanksgiving from the midst of the belly of the whale. Notice Jonah doesn't offer praise. It's missing, right? Jonah's not like, you're so wonderful, God, in this moment. But jo Jonah does offer thanks. Thanks for who God has been. Thanks for hearing him even from this place. Thanks for the realization that there is truly no place on earth where God cannot hear our prayers. Jonah turns this womb into a sanctuary. And I wonder if that's ever happened to you, if you've ever been someplace and suddenly realized it was holy. It happened to me once. I was in the hall of a Duke Divinity School. I was pulling a late night project on monastic life. And I had just finished, it was probably close to 1 a.m., and only the emergency lights were on in the hallway. And I stood up to just grab my bag, and all of a sudden, I was immensely aware that the hallway was covered in prayer. I could literally feel prayers seeping from the walls. It felt like I could almost hear all of those desperate pleas, prayers over papers and projects prayers over PhD programs and dissertations, prayers over career options and the future, prayers over divorces and family shattering in the midst of trying to go to school. It was the same exact hallway. I couldn't wrap my brain around it. It was the same exact place I'd walked a thousand times. And in that moment, I saw the Spirit of God moving in it. And I stood for I don't know how long, and I offered my own prayer of thanks, felt it get added to the wall. I went back the next day, and the hallway was just the hallway. There were the out-of-date posters and upcoming announcements. There were trash cans that hadn't been emptied, empty expo markers on the floor. I couldn't understand. But all I knew is that a place that had been stressful and difficult had suddenly become holy. And I think Jonah reminds us 
that every place can be a sanctuary if we're only attuned to the spirit of God. And so this week, I think our second question is, have you ever found one? Have you ever found yourself standing in the same place, an ordinary place, and seen it give way to God? This week, I want to challenge us to think about two things. If we are to remember when we were in the pit, what would our psalm of thanksgiving sound like? And if possible, where could we imagine God this week turning our ordinary into holy? As we move into this time of response, I'll invite you to join and stand in singing our invitation hymn. If you would like to make UBC your church home or make a decision to follow Christ, this time is also open for that. Let's join now our praises and petitions together as we sing hymn number 404, I Need Thee Every Hour.
knowledge this week that there is no place, no space where the Spirit of God cannot reach you, cannot hear you, cannot be with you. Please remain standing for our choral benediction. <laughs>